in civil society poverty. A lot of people noticed that. And then, as good Hegelians, they all thought contradictions are in Hegel there to be sublated. <coughs> what concept does uh, sublate the contradictions of civil society? The state. That is the traditional rendering, right? So problems in civil society on a higher logical level are somehow overcome. But what uh, interested me in the, in the PhD is that Hegel introduces a further qualification. Uh, he basically says that some poor, not all, some poor can generate a weird attitude, <laughs> namely the attitude that they think civil society, by constantly violating the principle it works by, is itself an injustice. And this conviction leads the uh, people, the poor people who have that conviction, to discredit, to fundamentally delegitimize civil society as such. Right? They're saying, why should we work if we try to work but cannot subsist, maybe due to unemployment and so forth, which is not simply our fault, but the structural problem. Right? And this is what qualifies for Hegel the rebel, this additional conviction. <laughs> Weird problems occur immediately. A, because this conviction does not appear. Right? So the poor, it's never entirely clear if the poor is simply poor or a poor rebel. Hegel then, in lecture notes, introduces a further twist to the whole argument and basically says there's not only the poor rebel, there's also the, also the rich rebel. These are people who basically think that the whole society simply works for them. Right? They are the ones who decide what is right and what is just. They mean everything that pleases them, the rich ones. And so what I tried to show is that in a certain sense, um, the, the uh, Hegelian philosophy of rights does not simply sublate the problem of poverty. But it indicates what Hegel at the end of the philosophy of rights uh, 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 explicitly claims, that all states have a history, and that means they emerge, endure, and die. They disappear. And my, the, the strong claim was the rabble is one of the potential reasons for the decline of the state, actually. Um, a further uh, uh, idea, I, uh, I tried to show why this, in a certain sense, anticipates the early Marx. Class struggle between these two fronts. So, but I was very much interested in, let's put it like that, the aesthetics of the appearance of that which does not appear other than in a conviction. Right? How does one, and Hegel basically says one cannot see an attitude. Right? You can't see actions whatsoever, but you, can, you cannot see the inner life of a person. So he indicates there something which does not appear as such, right? I mean, the, um, the, the conviction of, 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 the, of, the, of the power. But nonetheless, indicates with this uh, uh, what Marx later would call the, or describe as a structural place for revolution. So in a certain sense, the rabble draws a different conclusion that Hegel, or the standard Hegelian draws. It's not that the state sublates the contradictions of civil society, but the a conclusion the rabble draws is we need a different kind of organization of society. From that, um, and I was reading, I, I was influenced by, um, let's put it like that, the Frenchies at that time. So I was uh, translating Badiou's work and Montier's work and stuff like that. And I started in Paris with Badiou. And so this, uh, uh, and it was mainly Badiou who influenced me to try to see, let's say, how a certain historical conjuncture inf has impacts on philosophical thinking. So Hegel thinks something which then becomes actual in Marx, and um, so he indicates the moment of a proper transformation of, uh, uh, in philosophy from within. So the th second thing, and this was for me sort of consequential, e even though it's not a career maker, I can tell you, uh, mm -hmm. afterwards I decided to write a book on Badiou, because I was uh, struggling with the question that sort of derived from the, from the PhD. What is exactly the task of philosophy if it deals with political problems? And if, I mean, Badiou has this thesis that there are fields of practice that are non-philosophical uh, in which true transformation or real transformation can happen. Right? He enumerates four, love, art, science, and politics. And one, and he makes this quite gigantic claim that with the disappearance of any of these fields of practice, 
philosophy is threatened to disappear itself. So in a sense, if there is no revolutionary transformation in politics, right, and things become reactionary, whatever you want to want conservatives, or whatever you want to, want to want to label it, philosophy itself is threatened. Or there are weird impacts of that political situation on the very status of philosophy. So I was trying to clarify, and that was uh, what at least partially the book on, on Badiou does, mm -hmm. what how can one understand what's the task of philosophy in times when no transformations are happening? For example, political ones. Um, so if, if that interests you, you can go into that later. Um, and my, the brief answer is that, and this is what instructed my, the last thing I've worked on, which uh, is what the German call habilitation. I mean, this is what I've done afterwards. Um, this sort of led me uh, to, let's say, a reconfiguration of what classically was called ideology critique. And I was wondering uh, something which I, just like a few days, I noted that Lenin, okay, but, uh, a name that is not that often mentioned, but maybe, I mean, it's the century, so maybe that's okay. Um, that Lenin in 1920 already notes that certain fundamental concepts of, um, um, that seem to be per se emancipatory can become problematic or even reactionary or even uh, oppressive, namely freedom and equality. And I was, uh, I mean, that's Lenin's, right? And I was uh, simply struck by a, a very, very, very trivial fact, namely that from the very beginning of modern philosophy, so Descartes, you find that also in Kant, you also find that in Hegel, the, the great thinkers of freedom all endorse what seems to be the very opposite of freedom, namely predestination. You find that. Kant, you find that in Descartes, you find that in Hegel. That is surprising, right? And, and it's often, I mean, often not directly addressed how these two work together. And the short idea, I mean, to give you a very short idea, that, um, is that modern philosophy gains its form through these uh, different stations by a fundamental critique of problematic understandings of freedom. And these problematic understandings of freedom is an understanding of freedom, that freedom is something that we have in our possession as such. Always. This is the standard, sorry if you're an Aristotelian, but this is the standard interpretation of an Aristotelian. Because we're endowed with a certain capacity that is real, even if it's not actualized. That is, so, so to speak, actual before actualization. Right? Um, and this then makes us possible to act in this or that way. And my, the attempt of the habilitation was to show how modern philosophy uses predestination, which seems to be as the very uh, to be the very opposite of freedom, to get rid of this, let's say, spontaneous Aristotelianism, not of philosophy only, but of everyday life, because it's it leads to highly problematic uh, consequences in the conceptual uh, conceptualization, for example, of uh, of what it means to be practically engaged, and always, I mean, and I, I see that as a um, as uh, precipitated in a certain sense uh, by um, uh, by a struggle that Martin Luther had with Erasmus from Rotterdam, uh, because <coughs> Luther's conception of uh, freedom and Hegel always claimed he's a Lutheran and will remain so his whole life. Um, you you know that in famous Luther statements: "Here I stand; I can do no other." Right? Uh, kann ich anders? I'm compelled. Uh, um, so. I was trying to make sense what kind of freedom can it be that, for example, explains falling in love as an act of freedom. Because if you fall in love, there is no one responsible but you for falling in love. But at the same time, you never made that, I mean, one doesn't objectively make that decision. Right? It's not like, well, let's enlist features, that tall, nice hair, whatever, and then you fall in love. I mean, it, it sort of happens to you, but nonetheless, it's an act of freedom. It's similar, that there would be a further claim to uh, what you actually dream. Right? I mean, we're sometimes confused by what kind of dreams we have, but I mean, there is no one responsible but us. I mean, that's one of the starting points of psychoanalysis. Right? So, and I call this weird assumption that freedom is sort of aligned, conceptually aligned, with a compulsion to do in this or that way. I call that fatalism. Um, I stop here so you can uh, have an uh, overview and uh, Well, uh, <laughs> so my PhD is on uh, the French Marxist philosopher Louis Althusser. 
and the, the title of the work is Al Pisarma without Christian. Uh, actually, I started off as uh, Al Pisar, uh, reconstructing Al Pisar's critique of uh, critique of ideology, which I think what uh, he is most uh, famous for today. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, we, we all get these concepts that we use from what we said over determination, interpolation, uh, ideological state apparatuses. Um, what else is there? Uh, critique of humanism and all the rest of it. But there is another dimension to, to it, which is uh, his early work. I mean, uh, after the Second World War, Althusser started off as a, as a Christian Catholic. He was a member of uh, some, I forgot the names of those societies and uh, political organizations which were Christian in, in France. And um, his formative years were depending, uh, dependent on uh, Blaise Pascal, a book which, the only book which he read while he was in captivity during the, uh, during the war. And his main teacher was a uh, French Catholic uh, philosopher Jean uh, Guitton. Uh, so, okay, Althusser stands for perhaps one of the most uh, ambitious uh, projects in reconstructing uh, Marxism in the previous century after uh, after uh, after Stalin after uh, the fifties. The but uh, the religious dimension, introducing the religious dimension, the uh, Christianity into into the work of Althusser. Uh, I think gives it uh, 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 gives a new uh, light to the, to the to the whole world. Just a couple of years ago, uh, an interview came out with him. Perhaps the, the only interview he gave for Italian uh, uh, television, in which he explicitly explicitly says that the uh, premises of uh, religion, the universality and fraternity, uh, can be realized only in only in communism. And there are some texts on, of him in which he uh, uh, tries to liberate, uh, to liberate the church uh, from its uh, feudal uh, remnants. And he, there is an attempt of him to, uh, to create an alliance between the, uh, the, the proletarians and the, and the church, the believers. But then he gives up on this. So uh, the point is not to, to, to create the alliance, but to to liberate, uh, to liberate the, the, the church from its own uh, ideological confines. Uh, so, working through this, I came to the, some sort of uh, uh, conclusion that this point was at the end of the dichotomy between faith and uh, faith and, and, and belief. So, uh, to make a very big jump, perhaps faith is what can be today identified with so-called religious uh, fundamentalism or, or terrorism, whereas uh, belief is uh, uh, another another dimension, uh, another uh, dimension to it. But which is very interesting because later on, after he abandoned this uh, uh, so-called Christian uh, uh, Marxist phase, he goes on to uh, qualify uh, religion as an uh, as an ideology. Uh, so based on this, I, was, I started to read uh, the work of uh, Italian communist poet, filmmaker, what else he was, political activist, uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini. And uh, his film, uh, The Cross Bell, according to St. Matthew, was practically an um, uh, artistic example of Althusser's uh, pieces. But it's very interesting because for uh, uh, for Althusser, the party, regardless of, because he was a, a, a lifelong member of the French uh, Communist Party, even in its darkest uh, uh, moments, like May 68, whatever, uh, intervention in Hungary, Czech uh, Republic, and, and uh, Czechoslovakia back then. So unlike Sartre, he remained uh, a, party, uh, a, party, a party member worse. Uh, Pasolini was expelled from the party uh, because of his uh, because he's degenerating the youth with pornographic and uh, heretic uh, images. So uh, Althusser claims that uh, at the end in the 80s, practically just a year before he stopped writing, 
uh, sorry, publishing, uh, that uh, he remains a Christian. Uh, Pasolini uh, argues that uh, uh, the gospel according to uh, St. Matthew was uh, the most important uh, text on his intellectual intellectual uh, uh, formation. So based on this, then, uh, okay, so there are obviously some limits in the, in the work of, uh, of Althusser, so then uh, I thought that uh, a bombastic thesis, I don't know, uh, that uh, the uh, limits of Althusser's uh, philosophical system or his reconstruction or of Marxism are at the same time uh, the limits of the previous century uh, socialist uh, socialist uh, experiments. So where Althusser uh, stops, I think uh, Slava Zizek uh, in a way begins. So uh, now I'm working on for, for quite many years now, and I, there was an attempt to reconcile Zizek with Althusser, but failed miserably. Uh, so uh, I think now my research is focusing on on, on the work of, of, of Zizek. And the front we co-edited a book which was a response to uh, uh, Zizek's uh, absolute recall, which he. You read it just recently. He said that he thinks that it's the best book. That is the best book. We choose. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, another thing, just recently we finished a book together, Frank uh, Zizek and I. It is coming out, I think, in spring. It's called uh, Reading Marx. So it's uh, practically an an attempt to read Marx philosophically 150 years after the publication of uh, of uh, Capital. So, yeah, I think. <coughs> but maybe we can. Yeah. Um, maybe you want to say a word also about crisis and critique, because that's also oh, available. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, also for from this we uh, co-edit the journal together. Uh, it's online, uh, open access, crisiscritique.org. Uh, <laughs> uh, I can't remember how many issues, but, but quite, quite a lot of them. <laughs> okay, so first we did democracy uh, and revolutions, then we did a uh, critique today, then we did uh, religion, theology, and politics. Uh, it was the 50th, 50th anniversary of uh, um, Publication of Althusser's and his students reading Capital, so we did an issue on that. Then we did an issue on Stalin. Because we thought that's the best way to do yes. our results. <laughs> and you cannot imagine how difficult it is to find people who actually take up the challenge to write what Stalin It was the Stalin. most Seriously. difficult issue, along with the science. Mm. Uh, I want to talk about that later on. But okay, it was extremely difficult. Like it took us about a year and a half to put together an issue of perhaps 10 papers or something. So yeah, and then we went a little bit over the top and we decided to translate a crazy piece. It's really badly written, but nonetheless, it's symbolic. Uh, uh, dimension is far more interesting of the Albanian, Albania communist uh, leader, Enver Hoxha, uh, I mean, the Stalinist, if there ever was one. Uh, a piece where he tries to distantiate himself from Stalin, but fails and, and nonetheless. Okay, so after Stalin, what did we do? We did the critique of political economy? And Hegel. Hegel. No, no, critique of political economy, then Hegel. Mm -hmm. And now, in a month from now, we're publishing, uh, is it a month from now? Yeah. The, a really big issue on uh, the anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, so, well, we have, we have papers from uh, Badiou, a long interview that Frank and I did with Zizek, then Etienne Balibar. Uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, uh, who else? Uh, the Vice President of Bolivia, uh, Alvaro Garcia Linera, who's otherwise a really interesting uh, sociologist. Uh, Which is, I think, the best thing we've yes. done. Right? Uh, and in March, right, we're doing an uh, issue on science and philosophy, which is very interesting because that is that one is turning out to be a very difficult uh, uh, topic. 
because we thought we might tackle what became prominent and, and very weirdly, I mean, conjecturally, if you take a look, as speculative realism. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of that label, it made uh, an immense career, actually. And it brought about very pe or peculiar, that's a bit like that, pe peculiar phenomena, at least what I, I can say from a Berlinian perspective. Because all the, I mean, in Berlin, what happened is that uh, a lot of people were bored by philosophy taught in the universities, which was, as even the old, I don't know if you if you ever heard that name of a rather conservative uh, tubing professor, Manfred Frank, uh, uh, he published a piece in a, in a German newspaper basically saying, if you want to study German philosophy, move to the US, because what you get in German philosophy departments is an adaptation of modern American pragmatism. Ben McDowell, all these people who are very influential. Um, and if you don't want to read Hegel or Kant with them as uh, the reply of a guy from the Humboldt University uh, uh, then, then, then read, you can still do history of philosophy. That means you're not systematically contributing to the questions we're all bothered with. Right? So, um, so fed up with this situation, speculative realism was the ultimate present uh, and promise to all students who were so bored by these kind of, this kind of doing philosophy. Because it came with the promise to just like forget about tradition. I mean, to just write your own ontology from scratch. At least this is what, how it was perceived, actually. Uh, and it drew a, a huge amount of people. Which I don't want to discredit because I think, I mean, that would be my, my version, I don't know if you, if you would agree with that. Not only are, uh, are people aligned to that label serious, some of them at least, not all, well, but I mean, some of our, some, some <laughs> serious, yeah. But um, somehow what happened then was, let's say, a move from one extreme into the other. If, if philosophy is American, an Americanized Hegel, we don't want to do philosophy. And then we just want to do our philosophy. And then a lot of other things um, merged into that, let's say, into that new trend, object-oriented ontology and stuff like that, which then through an influence of the art scene became super, super, not, not I mean, sort of, not super institutionally strong in the, in the sense of educational institutions, but spread everywhere, dominated, started to, not dominate, but become rather hegemonic in certain discussions. Uh, if you're a Hegelian, you don't get what uh, Latour is saying at the neck of the degree and the stuff that's related to it. And this was, is simply a peculiar phenomenon, the promise linked to this kind of undoing of tradition, redoing. I mean, I have PhD students who tell me that what they want to do in their PhD is write their own ontology. Without bothering to read, I don't, and maybe I'm just like, too conservative. They could be, but um, without bothering to read Plato or whatsoever, they just don't. They think they can just like build that from scratch, and that is an interesting phenomenon. I think. So we partially thought we could address that. <laughs> <laughs> There's another dimension to that, but uh, at least the previous century, the French is uh, were mm -hmm. very serious about the science. You know, like. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a long tradition there. And yes. Marx's writing. Yes, I mean, uh, the, the idea is um, that we didn't want to, uh, neither of us wanted to return to whatever doctrinal apparatus there might be. So we didn't want to compete with, in, or we don't, didn't want to enter the competition who's the best, best Marxist, right? who's the most, uh, or the best historical materialist, or something like that. So we, um, what we try to do is to see what kind of, let's say, short circuits can be produced, uh, can be productive in reading models. So for example, to just give you a sense of that, um, if you read the first, um, first sentence of the first volume of Capital, Marx talks about when um, um, the wealth of contemporary society appears, appears, this is important, as a gigantic collection of commodities. So from the first uh, sentence onwards, Marx talks about the logic of appearance. Um, and 
this appearance, this logic of appearance, is somehow weirdly deceiving. It's so deceiving that even if you understand how it works, it's still deceiving. I mean, this is, I mean, one, I think, famous, famous, famous definition that, that Althusser uh, claimed to uh, have gotten from the last book of Spinoza's Ethics, right? I mean, if, okay, right now this example doesn't work, but if you take a look at the sun, and, uh, it appears to you like a tiny uh, tennis ball. Right? And then you do a lot of science, and then you know how big it is and how everything works. And then you go outside and take a look at the sun, and it nonetheless appears to you as a tennis ball. Right? I mean, that's somehow, um, I mean, what psychoanalysis calls uh, fetishistic disavowal. Je, je sais bien, uh, je sais bien, mais quand même. Right? I know very well, but nevertheless. This is somehow built into the structure. And my, my stupid idea was um, to see what happens if one reads what Marx does in Capital as a revamping of Plato's cave library. I mean, because there, you also get a logic of appearance. Um, one of the words that uh, Marx uses frequently in depicting the logic of commodity circulation and production is shadow, shadow. Uh, Derrida already noticed that in Marx's spectrum. The spectrum is a shadowy entity, right? even the spectrum of comedy. So, um, and I, I, I was wondering what kind of cave would that be if capitalism was a cave? <laughs> right? I mean, uh, the chains must be reconceptualized, right? so, um, the source of light must be reconceptualized. Um, so it, everything needs to be conceptualized, and maybe there is not even an outside of the cave, but um, right? I mean, somehow this, this was, for, for, from my perspective, paradigmatic, or trying trying to to, to to make a paradigmatic case for this kind of methodology to produce productive short, shortcuts. And maybe they miserably fail. I mean, it can be that we just have to learn that there's nothing to be gained from putting Plato, this specific Plato and Marx together. But I mean, that's the attempt of producing something outside orthodox and the reconstitution of orthodox Marxism. And in this sense, what can one do with Marx as a conceptual philosopher? That's that's sort of the idea. I hope I didn't spoil too much. No. Only <laughs> well, you know that. <laughs> is that somehow related to what you think is the path to philosophy and where is the transformation is happening? Is it to make philosophical meanings of philosophy yeah. instead of really immediately relevant or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the, uh, that's sort of, I mean, my, my, my weird answer that I tried to give in the habilitation and in a book which came out which was part of it, by endorsing fatalism is sort of my answer for what philosophy can do when there is no transformation. Uh, let's put it like that. Ask if, you, if one has read just a tiny little bit of but you, right? Uh, what he introduces as the, with the concept of the event is a transformation which you don't anticipate but which later, so to speak, becomes a life changer. Gets you involved, uh, makes you active in a way, you understand, reorients you and all that stuff. So the question I tried to answer, and that is already the answer, sort of my, my kind of answer to your question, what is the task of philosophy? I would say to prepare for events. That would be my most minimal definition. I think you already find that in Plato. I mean, the Cato library is a kind of a library that precisely deals with these kinds of things. So how, but how can one prepare for that, for that, for which by definition you cannot prepare? Right? Because if an event is truly something unforeseeable happening and a happenstance purely contingent, you cannot prepare. I mean, how to prepare? How does one prepare to fall in love? Hmm. And the short version of the answer is by assuming that one will never fall in love. Because by assuming the impossibility of ever falling in love, you see that something impossible needs to be thought that then becomes possible in if something happens. So, I mean, Jacques Lacan once defines uh, the task of psychoanalytic cure to raise an incapacity to a point of impossibility. So this is sort of what I think is not only a definition of an psychoanalysis, but sort of a definition, at least in my, my, my reconstruction of modern philosophy somehow. 
Um, and this can have, I think, very, very, very trivial, practical even impacts. Not only, I mean, it, it sort of protects you from conceptual confusion, I mean, and gets rid of problematic, I think, understandings of freedom, I mean, which the French theorist of catastrophe, uh, Jean-Pierre Dupuy, once called supermarket freedom, right? the freedom to choose whatever, pick that one, that one. But I mean, Dupuy, for example, has a wonderful, I think, wonderful line on, on for example, the politics of climate change. And I think there is, is a certain similarity because his argument is we know very well that climate change is going to happen. And we also know that climate change means if there is a change of the climate, we cannot simply turn it back. Right? So the calculation with 2% of uh, temperature increase and so forth is a very risky, risky calculation. And Dupuy goes so far as to claim this is the precise reason why the climate catastrophe will happen because of our dealing and uh, ways of trying to cope with preventing the catastrophe. Right? The ways in which we try to prevent the catastrophe are precisely what will bring about the catastrophe. So how does one change that? Dupuy uh, calls that <clears throat> um, apocalypticism is to assume that the apocalypse, if we continue to do what we do, is absolutely certain. It's not something in the future, but in a sense it always already happens and the, the symptom of that is precisely our way of trying to prevent the apocalypse. So you see, I mean, in this sense, if you think climate is something we can simply manage because it's on, uh, in our power, right? and we turn it back, turn it on, whatever, um, this is precisely the problem which will bring about what uh, we try to prevent. And the priest, and I think, the, I'm, I'm trying with the, with, the, with the argument of fatalism to, uh, to repeat that as a, let's say, not, not pragmatical, but rather philosophical conceptualization, which I trace to different uh, different thinkers um, that even I mean um, literally speak of fatalism. I mean, Descartes in the Passions of the Soul endorses la fatalité. There is a uh, less known, but uh, back in the day, very very prominent Kantian guy, uh, the one who edited the first uh, Kant dictionary called Karl Christian Erhard Schmidt like a good Carl Schmidt, if you wish, um, uh, who coined the term intelligible fatalism. Uh, and his argument is very, very close to what I'm saying. So in a one-sentence answer, somehow its task of philosophy is somehow to prepare for that which one cannot prepare. And uh, the name for that is, my name for that, is fatalism. Because it leads you to assume something that seems to be entirely impossible. And that's the first step. It's not yet transformation, it's, but it indicates the place of transformation. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, Nietzsche <coughs> or Bollywood's reading of Nietzsche's anti philosophy that makes a good point about how kind of Nietzsche's madness and where. The Nietzschean system kind of fails or collapses on itself is precisely in the attempt to prepare his own coming as the savior. Um, but then I guess it's because Nietzsche wants to prepare himself as kind of his big other, and that perhaps there is a difference then to prevent you from going mad if you don't prepare. Or the philosopher. <laughs> in this preparation doesn't prepare philosophy as such, but some other condition external yeah. to philosophy. Yes. No, no, I, 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 you're right. I mean, this is why, I mean, I introduced a, a, a very not charming sounding um, concept to indicate this, because somehow, I mean, if we're talking about, about you, any any transformation needs to have an agent, but you call that agent subject. Any subject, because it's not fully capable of controlling all the consequences of its action, is, as he articulated, split. Right? On the one hand side, there is it relates to the origin or what it sees as the origin of transformation that you calls an event. And on the other hand side, it somehow does not know what to make of it, but nonetheless tries to make something out of it. Right? Um, because um, it's completely unclear what follows, just like practically, after 
someone, I mean, you say to someone, hey, I love you. What does that mean? Buying a cat, a fish, moving into, I mean, right? I mean, it's, it's completely up to you what follows then afterwards. So in a sense, what I'm trying to say is, but you conceive of the agents of transformation as part of split subjects. If philosophy prepares um, for transformations that need to happen outside of philosophy, so the task of philosophy is to prepare for uh, novelty or transformation in politics and art and whatsoever, in different fields of practice. The whole question is, is there something like a philosophical subject? Is there like a you know, shitty version of Hegel, like a super meta subject of all subjects, which is the philosopher, the female or not? Um, and I'm trying to prevent this from happening by saying, if all subjects in all non-philosophical fields of practice as agents of transformation are split or barred, the subject which prepares for this kind of subject to emerge must be doubly barred. It must be a barred, barred subject, a split, split subject. So it sort of prepares for being split, prepares for the bar, prepares for something, which is not simply assuming a subjective position that, that is. And this is why I, uh, the, the things that people usually take as, I don't know, Holtman's nostalgia when Badiou says, if you want to do philosophy, you need to be in love, you need to be in touch with contemporary art, you need to be politically engaged, and you need to know something about contemporary science. I don't read that as a, uh, um, as a conservative or nostalgic or self-heroizing gesture, but rather it's an indication that this, the, 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 the discursive position of the philosopher it's somehow is, um, um, is produced right, by, by the intersection of non-philosophical fields of practice. So philosophy itself is not self-sustaining, to put it like that. The only task of philosophy, to put it differently, is to change happening outside of philosophy. Because otherwise, I mean, that's academicism. And one can get the impression quite swiftly if you have, I mean, in my mind, if you have listened to certain philosophical debates. I mean, it's hard to understand what they're even debating sometimes. Um, I mean, for me, I mean, but maybe. Does that make sense? I mean, you know. Yeah. <laughs> how, so, would, how, how would you write, how would you formalize the split, split subject, the double split subject? The, what is the other split? It's precisely the position of the barring. Oh. So I'm not saying, right? I mean, the, 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 any subject, that's the basic lesson of psychoanalysis, right? Is um, a subject is something and something else on the other side, right? And the, the something else on the other side, you can take away more and more and more and more. And in the end, there is nothing. <laughs> so, and then even that Zizek's twist, you can even take the nothingness of nothing. So, right? I mean, that's, that's, so what I'm trying to say is that the weird position of philosophy, this is why I try to describe it as an intersection between the different fields of practice, is sort of as taking the position of the bar, of the barring more precisely. It's, not, it's neither the one side nor the other side, nor the totality of the two sides, but it's precisely indicating that there can be something like a bar. It's very close to what the analysts so in this sense, I would opt for analytic philosophy, but I mean differently. Um, <laughs> no, I just want to, if I can rephrase my question a little yeah. bit, because I also am kind of curious about not only the theory behind it, but the kind of practice of doing this kind of philosophy. And that's why I also wondered that if you then are working with reading Marx in relation to looking at the cave and capitalism as forms of appearing and, and, and stuff like that, how that then is related to your idea of what the task of philosophy is today. If that's also a kind of fatalism, and it, it is a kind of fatalism, <laughs> is it thematic? Is it in the writing? Is it in the positioning? Is it in the effects that you think it would have? Or is it just a completely different project? 
No, I think it's somehow connected because I mean um, there is the standard standard criticism of alternative ways of organizing society, and I think uh, this this criticism is partially correct by saying even the kind of uh, society we imagine to be non-capitalist is shaped by the very imagination we get from capital. I mean, that's a reproach that's often made. I mean, even Zizek made this reproach several times to Marx that this is the ultimate Marxian limit, right? I mean, um, to conceive of a, of a, of a society uh, that would be non-capitalistically organized as simply, in a way, the negation, and then you can off capital, uh, of a capitalistically organized society. So in a sense, I would argue, yes, part of this is to accept that things are more fucked up than one would like to. Yes, I, I would. And um, because this prevents certain things it, um, uh, and certain certain assumptions, it, for example, prevents the assumption that we simply have to decipher, unravel, or present to everyone, bring to race to the level of consciousness, uh, the very workings of capital. I mean, if that were the problem, right, then there will, would be no problem. Uh, some, I mean, uh, you know that uh, there is this wonderful, wonderful brief scene in uh, Betterbrecht's The Life of Galileo, where he basically travels to an island, and he, when, when arriving there on the ship, he sees uh, uh, kids throwing stones at the house of an old woman, right? uh, who they, who they um, 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 uh, describe or they cry, you witch, you witch, you witch. And he arrives, and as the good enlightenment figure that Galileo is, he goes to the kids and says, well, she's not a witch don't exist, she's just an old woman with a crooked and so forth. And um, as if the task is solved, he enters the ship and leaves the island, and the last thing he sees is how the kids burn down the house. Right. Somehow, and how does one, um, let's say, prevent this kind of interpretation, arrogant interpretation of the very functioning of enlightenment? And my, my answer, once again, would be fatalism. Yeah. I mean, not as a solution. But as a necessary, let's say, vanishing media or uh, mediator or transitory stuff. I mean, somehow it is, I think, conceptually helpful uh, to first accept how bad things actually are. And, that's, and then, then one can see, and then the argument gets a bit more, more complicated, I think. Um, if I, I mean, just like if, if I, can I have two more minutes? I, uh, um, can I? Uh, and then I shut up and you answer all the other questions. Um, um, because, I mean, I think Hegel has a wonderful, wonderful account, and this may be, may be a longish version of an answer, but I hope it, it sort of is an answer. Um, why one cannot simply get rid of God? Why, why the idea that we don't believe in God uh, doesn't work, because there are immediate, you know that graffiti that says uh, uh, God is that, and then behind it says in brackets, the author is Nietzsche, and then uh, <laughs> the other like, graffiti is uh, uh, Nietzsche is dead, in brackets, God. Right? Um, which is sort of the truth of the first, I would say. I mean, somehow, somehow there, there is always something appearing in that very place where God appears, be it reason, be it whatever laws of history. And Hegel shows in his philosophy of history that one first needs to understand history as a proper development of freedom. One first needs the assumption that there is a plan, that there is predestination. Then one in the second step can show that this plan is a very peculiar self-negating plan. I would say the only Hegel shows that God's the only plan God had is that he had no plan. And if you get there, uh, you have to think a god that has no plan. And a god that has no plan is somehow weirdly not God. So in a sense, what I'm trying to say is one needs to traverse what conceptually cannot be avoided. And philosophy somehow prepares not for real action. And this is why I think the, the old Marxist question of realizing philosophy, I think mean, that's the old Marxist question. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I would refrain from putting it that way. But I think what philosophy can do is to clear the stage for what it means to act, in the sense. Right? And part of that is 
And uh, maybe I should specify that last sentence, I promise, that this is not a tragic or nihilistic or whatever uh, conception. I think, and Hegel shows that clearly, the best way to do that is comedy. Right? I mean, that's how the, the, the lectures on art and uh, comedy is the highest form. Because it's a comic way of basically assuming something which leads you into contradictions. And I think the whole, this is why I wanted to say that, the whole phenomenology of spirit is a wonderful catalog of ways um, of the, which depicts the inventiveness of people who know that certain things are not the way they thought they are, but they nonetheless want to do that. I mean, from, from the first chapters, I think, Hegel showed, I mean, people invent religions simply to uh, still stick to sense certainty in, in a way that would be functioning. So resistances are constitutive and very inventive. So this is why I think um, enlightenment is not the answer, but an, a proper account of all the ways we try to get rid around what is the absolutely rational insight that things are screwed. Uh, that would be the uh, right. I mean, um, uh, that we are not yet in freedom. That we're, and so forth. To accept that um, uh, that things are far worse than we think. Um, to to get to that point, one needs a proper analysis of resistances, and I think philosophy can also offer that. Resistances in what sense? Um, of resisting a fully rational choice, oh. uh, a, a rational yeah, insight. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I mean, simply because it's not that easy to accept that one is not free, unless one is compelled to be free. Mm -hmm. or forced, I mean, if if my claim, you can say if you find that mad or whatever, um, if my claim that falling in love has something to do with freedom, there is like, there is a certain kind of compulsion and. I mean, Kant calls uh, um, um, the pure act of freedom, um, um, what is that? Uh, an action before, uh, uh, that precedes any kind of appearance, uh, a transcendental act before uh, any, 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 any logic of appearance is that. So freedom somehow is, is, is based on the very, where, um, where one deals with the very constitution of something. Again, what I'm trying to say, philosophy can somehow clarify that certain conceptions of freedom or equality, one could extend that, are conceptually insufficient and uh, clarify what needs to be assumed, but also clarify what, why it is almost impossible to assume. And that's comedy. There is a certain comedy involved of not assuming the rational. That was far longer than I thought. Does that make sense? <coughs>